Sweet a prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my father's throne make all my wants and wishes in seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by the return. Sweet heart of prayer. Our scripture reading this morning is Mark 6, 51 and 52. Mark 6, 51 and 52. And he went, went up onto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wonder. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. All right, so the title here is there is no freedom without bread. Um, it was actually a slogan from 1989, I think it was, so how long ago was that, 34, 33, 34 years ago? It's a long time. Does anybody remember that, that those few years between 1989, 1991, what was happening in the world? What was going on? Was the wall coming down? Yeah, yeah, the wall was, the wall was coming down. And I guess apparently this was one of the catch, catch slogans of it. And it's actually the title of a, of a book. This gentleman, Konstantin uh, Pleshikov, uh, wrote this book. He said there, it, it's titled, There's No Freedom Without Bread. And it just kind of chronicles kind of the philosophical and political ins and outs that happened here. You know, he, he believes it wasn't just, you know, uh, Reagan telling Gorbachev, bring down this wall. Right? He said there was a lot more to it, that it was a little complicated. And he says something, I, I didn't read the whole book, there are excerpts of it, but actually, you know, you can get it on Amazon now for a whole dollar. I guess when books get older, right? So, uh, it was a 1989 revolution slogan, I guess when they brought this wall down. And he says something very interesting in the book, which I thought was pretty profound, you know, even in the secular society, I thought it was pretty profound. The correlation between prosperity and liberty is never simple. And I think even in, in spiritual circles, the correlation between prosperity and liberty is never simple either. You know, we're doing this weekly study in the book of Ecclesiastes, and Solomon, I think he kind of nailed that. Because he talked about all the, all the things in this world that we want to attain. And it doesn't necessarily give us liberty. If anything, it kind of causes us less sleep. It causes us to be chained to our, to our, our prosperity, if you will. And we don't seem to get freedom from it. And even a lot of times, our, our wealth sometimes, in a way, deprives others of a blessing. If we look at it like that. So Jesus himself, he was dealing with this issue when he came here in the flesh. Actually, this is something he's been dealing with with humanity for a long time, isn't it? 
Um, there's this quote I found in this book called Christ Object Lessons. I'm sure a lot of you know this book. And it has an interesting thought on prosperity. It says that they, and Jesus it was referring to the, or the story is being referred here to the Jewish nation. It says they forgot God and lost sight of their high privilege as his representatives. It says the blessings they had received brought no blessing to the world. So they received this prosperity, but this prosperity wasn't really a gift to the world. It wasn't a blessing to the world. All their advantages were appropriated for their own glorification. Isn't that an interesting, interesting statement? Kind of a commentary. You know, we're going to be looking at Mark's. We're going to be looking at a few stories in Mark six, Mark seven, and Mark eight. Um, you wonder, Don, if they misused and misallocated the tithe and offering. Yeah, yeah, and it, you know, and, and even not only in the physical sense, but also that weren't they withholding the blessing that God wanted them to be to the world, and the, the, the spiritual blessing, I guess, that was withheld. So, yeah, you're absolutely right, James, that that there was this, there was this, uh, there was this holistic kind of issue, or situation that was going on with the Jewish people. So they appropriated it for their own, for their own glorification. And what happens when we do that, right? Solomon, again, he nailed that. He says it just becomes a despairing thing. It becomes vanity. All is vanity, right? He talks about. So it's really, it really becomes useless, and it doesn't serve anyone. Hosea 10.1 tells us that Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. Yeah. Do you know, when we talk about Israel, we need to understand we're talking about us. You know, this is a typology for the church today. It's for us. So, uh, in, this, in this book, in another area, it says Christ was their instructor as he had been with them in the wilderness. So he was still to be their teacher and guide. So, Christ was there for his people way back. And he was there for his people. And here, they actually had the teacher in the flesh, which was going to be a blessing for them. But there was a problem. Right? There was a problem because that wealth, that wealth, that prosperity, that power, everything that they had, if you will, uh, was really causing them to resist the blessing that he wanted so much for them to receive. It says later on in this book, he says that they saw that his teaching was placing them where their selfishness would be uncloaked. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a good thing. Yeah. We need to have Christ teach us and reveal to us right, the unselfishness that's in us. He wants to reveal to us. You know, there's this term that Jesus used where he talked about the axe being laid to the root. And that's, that's for us. That's for us as individuals. That wasn't just for the Jewish nation. He wants to, he wants to lay us open to understand what we really are. And you know, in... in in humanity, when you cut someone off at the root, you don't want them to grow back. That's how human nature is. You know, your your enemy or your you know whoever whoever you're facing off against, you want to defeat them and defeat them utterly. But that's not the way of God, is it? That's not His way. Because He's the giver of life. So when He lays when He when He cuts off at the root, His intention is to grow something new, right? And it's going to be a blessing after that. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. So the first uh, story I want to look at was the feeding of the 5,000. And that's a little, little later on in Mark 6, right? I think it starts in 36. And, you know, before this, before this miracle happened, um, the story in Mark 6, it talks about John the Baptist and what happened to him and how his disciples had gathered his body and put him to rest. And then Jesus, you know, being, being the compassionate God that he is, he said, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Right? He was always looking and understanding that, you know, that there are hurts in this world and he wants to, he wants to heal and heal the brokenhearted. And I'm sure his disciples, the disciples of John the Baptist were quite brokenhearted at this time. But, you know, as is with Jesus, right, he was always attracting a crowd, wasn't he? 
And in 34 it says, And Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So uh, I'm just going to pop over here to verse 35. And it says, By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. And he said, Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. So what was Jesus' reply? He said, You give them something to eat. Remember the axe that's being laid at the root? The axe was being laid at the root right here to the disciples. Because they had been with Jesus now for some time. I'm not sure exactly how long they were with Jesus when this happened. But previously, he had sent them out two by two, didn't he? And he sent them out with the power to, to cast out demons. He sent them out with the power to heal the sick. So he did all these things and, and to preach the word of God. To this, uh, to this sin-sick world he sent them out to. And yet, you know, we come to this story and they're like astonished that he would ask them, you feed them. So they said, that's going to take a year's wages. Are we going to spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? And how many loaves do you have? Well, how many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. And, and uh, he asked, go and see. And so they found out that they had five loaves and two fish. So Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. He broke the loaves then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And he also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. So the disciples picked up the 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish, and the number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. I always find it interesting, too, that they always seem to number. They always number when it comes along here. So, you know, I think everything that, that God puts in his word is important sometimes, and we need to understand that. Um, you know, in this story, there's a contrast between the 4,000 and the 5,000 that, that comes up. And it, it's interesting, it has to do with the baskets. I don't know if you've ever heard the translations of the baskets, but look in your concordance sometime, but I'm going to share it a little bit later. So, um, Jesus, you know, I, I kind of like to take, take little, little snippets of what Jesus was saying, but, you know, he looked up to heaven, right? He had taken this food, he had looked up to heaven. So his dependence, he was showing them his dependence was on God. And he took this and he blessed it. Again, putting his trust in God, broke it. And you know that breaking is interesting because I think he was trying to teach his disciples a story here that because later on he was going to literally say the bread of life was going to be broken for them. So he gave it to his disciples to distribute and the people were satisfied. And of course we had 12 baskets left over. So when I was thinking about this, of course those numbers, right, uh, 5,000 and the number 12, it really does define the Jewish people. They're defined based on the Mosaic Law, the Pentateuch, right? Those first five books, right? It's the Law and the Testimony. And of course, that, that 12 just identifies them as the 12 tribes. And of course, Jesus set aside 12 disciples, didn't he? So, you know, he's showing the people that they had an identity and a liberty. But the struggle is, is that they were denying others this identity. You know, by withholding the prosperity. And Jesus was trying to show the people that there is prosperity in him. That everybody can have life. That everybody can be, be prosperous. And I'm not saying just in the physical sense, but God can do that. We know that, right? He has blessed, he's blessed us immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. Amen. But in the spiritual sense. Jesus wanted to teach that others, especially other Jews, and I think that's why this, this specific 5,000 had dealt with the Jewish people, can prosper and have their identity. I mean, what was the leadership of the Jewish nation? How did they look upon people even in their own nation? Right? If you were sick, or if you were, you know, if you were sick, or if you were diseased, they always thought you were cursed of God, right? Mm -hmm. They always looked at it like that. If you didn't have wealth, you were cursed of God. Mm -hmm. So they had this skewed, this skewed view of, of God 
and not understanding that God wants to bless and prosper everyone and give everybody an identity. The story about Jesus walking on the water uh, was later on in verse 45. So after this, after this miracle of the 5,000, uh, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And Jesus, he saw them toiling in the rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. I wonder if uh, this was a life lesson for them as well, too, because it seems like whenever we don't have God on our side, we're always rowing against the wind, aren't we? We're always fighting against, against forces on our own. Well, anyways, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. So, so this, you know, I, I never realized in these stories that Jesus walked on water a couple of times, didn't he? Didn't he walk on water here, and then he walked on water, and had Peter come out and walk on water, didn't he? For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And that it is I is, is an interesting little thought too because he was telling them he was the self-existent one. That, that really translates E-M-E -E in, in the Greek, which means he is the self-existent one. He is the I am, right, he was saying here. So he was wanting to say, do not fear, do not fear. It says, then he went up into the boat to them and the wind ceased and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. And this is what Dan had read. He says, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Isn't this a weird place to put this? Wouldn't you think that, that Mark, you know, Mark is prophesying here that they understood or they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. I mean, here they just witnessed a miracle, but he's going back to the loaves. What were the disciples missing here? So, after this, Jesus um, goes to the goes to the, the Gerenzes, I think it is, and that's where, that's where the Gentiles were living, right? And over there, he had run into this Syrophoenician woman, or actually she came seeking out him. Uh, verse 24 in Mark 7, it says, From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For, for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. She's persistent. She's persistent. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, I've always wondered about that. It just seems like a cruel, a cruel thing to say to somebody. But and she answered, though, and said to him persistently, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. I want you to know this, this parable is about bread, again, too, just like the other ones were about bread. And then he said to her, For this saying, Go your way, the demon has gone out of you. I think in Matthew uh, it says you, you showed great faith and your daughter, the demon has gone out of your daughter. So, what's going on here? Well, and when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. So, the woman, she was an outcast as far as the temple went, right? Some people say she had three strikes against her, first being a woman being a Gentile, and being a Syrophoenician Gentile, I think was even worse, apparently. So she went as an outcast. Uh, she was an outcast. And the food, of course, that's being talked about in here is not literal food, is it? Right? It's talking about the Word of God. And she's telling the Lord that although she may not be accepted into the synagogue, she is partaking of all the spiritual food or truths that she can See, she had an understanding of something here that the disciples did not have an understanding of. That she was before the life giver. What, what did she do first? When she first came, she fell and worshipped him. She understood who she was giving her adoration to. She understood that he was the life giver. She understood he was the bread of life. And she said even by partaking of his crumbs, she was going to get life. You know, and this is a hard, it's a hard lesson for us to learn. And you, you see that. And to your point, he, he continues to bring it over and over and over again through the disciples, you know, through these miracles, 
through these life lessons that he's teaching, he's continuing to bring it through. When, when you back up to uh, 21, 22, yes, go 23, ahead. You, you see what was in their hearts and minds, and he, he's just trying to show them something new. Yes. Yeah. Maybe not new, but something different in there. Yeah, and life changing, because, because the alternative to this was, was going to be death for them. You know, we, we die either way. You know, we allow God to let that, let that axe cut to the marrow, or we don't. But either way, we die. And it's better to die in Christ, right? To die to, to really receive understanding, I think is the point. But her faith was incredible. She knew enough to realize she was seeing the Christ. And then from this story, Jesus takes them. He takes them to this to this miracle of the feeding of the four thousand. I think in between that he might have healed a deaf, might have healed a deaf person, which again is interesting because he has a he has a, a rebuke for his disciples after this miracle. Um, it says in those days the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat. And again, these four thousand. He's dealing with Gentiles. You know, he's in that Gentile region. So this is different from the first miracle in that sense as well. But in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And he said, if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. And then his disciples answered him once again. Boy, we are stubborn. We don't get it sometimes, do we? We don't get it. How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said to set them also before them. So they ate and were satisfied. So it's kind of the same. God uses the same methods, right? Doesn't he? And they took up, and these methods, I'll show you at the end, kind of have a lesson in and of themselves. So they ate and were satisfied, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. The question that they raised, you know, uh, how can a man satisfy these men? You know, it, it's a, a it's an excellent question that we have to ask ourselves when we're yes. facing situations and circumstances before yes. us. Yes. There is nothing within Amen. that can satisfy. Thank you. It Thank only you comes from above. Amen. Yeah, we have to get out of the worldly thought pattern and get yes. into the his kingdom, yep. the spiritual world. That's right. He alone, he alone can satisfy. That's right, and yet he imparts that gift to us that we can, as his ambassadors, if you will. But like the disciples, we don't learn very fast. No, no, no. He has to take us over that ground over and over and over. So he shares again here, he says, Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Here again, uh, he took, he gave thanks, he broke, he gave to his disciples to give to the multitude, he blessed the fish, he, they ate. And we're satisfied. And of course, whoop, I'm sorry, we have we have the seven baskets left and the seven loaves that started it as well. The baskets I found I found interesting. I don't know if any of you have ever looked at the translations of these baskets, but this was a basket at the feeding of the four thousand. It's spurs. And it's actually a basket apparently that's used for seeding, for spreading seed, for sowing. Oh boy, isn't there a, an interesting story to that? And interestingly, it's a much larger basket than the basket that was used during the feeding of the 5,000. That basket was a kofinos, which is like a small basket, like a little lunch basket or something like that. So I thought that was, that was interesting, you know, that, that what was left over for the Gentiles was a great basket. Maybe it was a great, great blessing to them. Whereas for the Jewish nation, it was just, well, a small blessing. This is okay, but maybe it's not, you know. I don't know. I, I'm just I'm just kind of speculating in my mind. Anyways. So yes, first some coffee notes.
So Mark 8 continued, it says, Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a, seek a sign? And you know, he's been having this back and forth with the Pharisees and the leadership of the, of the, uh, of the Jewish people, you know, all along throughout these scriptures. Once they found out that he was, he was claiming he was the Messiah. And he left them, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. And now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. There's that bread again. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. You know, we always talk about the leaven of the Pharisees, but we, don't, we sometimes leave out that leaven of Herod, right? That we're supposed to be careful, you know, what we view out here, right? not only spiritually, but also in the world, right? Here it's political, right? The leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it's because we have no bread. So they're still stuck. After all this time, they're still stuck on the, the literalness of, of bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? You know, he's trying to tell them, listen, this negative talk is just, it's, it's too much. It's too much. You know, he was trying to show them that the bread of life was abundant, and it was free, and it was, it was going to set people free. And it was, it was an amazing blessing that all could have in abundance. Like a double portion. You know, I see that in the 12 baskets, it's a double portion for the people of Israel. Like the seven baskets for the Gentiles, it's a double portion for them. He says, do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes do you not see? And having ears do you not hear? And interestingly, right before this, he healed a deaf man. And then right after this, he heals a blind person. So I think it's quite interesting how he brings these up. Oh, I guess. The part of their, their lack of understanding perceiving is that they were going so much by emotions because they were sorely amazed. They were just, you know, they needed that emotional response yeah. and they yeah. depended on that. Now, here they're in different straits and their emotions are not serving them. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Yep, and having ears you not hear. And you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. So he said to them, how is it you do not understand? How is it you do not understand? <coughs> So Jesus, you know, one last, I think this is one last opportunity he had was, was in Mark 14. It says, it says they were at the supper gathered together with him. And as they were eating, Mark 14, 22, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, broke it, gave it. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? 5,000 and 4,000 feeding. Then he said, take, eat, this is my body. He couldn't be any plainer, could he? What was going on now? Mark 14, verse 27, he tells them after, he says, You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And what did Peter say, of course, right? Even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. So God was trying to, or Jesus, who is God, is trying to tell them something important here, that he is the bread of life. I have these scriptures. These are all from John 6, verses 47 to 41. I hope you can, uh, you might not be able to see them all, but I can read them for you. He says, I tell you the truth that he who believes has ever, everlasting life. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am it. He's plainly saying, I am the bread of life. He says, your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. 
But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And then he goes on to say, This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You know, when we go to that, that verse we all know so well, For God so loved the world, we see that he took, right? He took our place. He broke, right? His body was broken. He was talking about the bread as he broke it and separated it. You know, we are blessed as we hunger and thirst. As we hunger and thirst for this truth, the truth that God is love, that He ultimately is love, that He loves us so much. Because He gave Himself for us. He poured out a blessing that overflows. He gave us a double portion, right? Wasn't He at, at His death? We received the blessing that we can't even begin to think or imagine so that we could be satisfied, right? So we could be at peace. No matter what happens out there in our lives, see that the, the, the issues, the hurts, the suffering, the sorrows, the disappointments, the turmoils, the craziness out there in the world today, it, it doesn't go away, but yet in the midst of that, he tells us that we can be satisfied. We can be at peace. Well, lastly here in this message today, there is no freedom without the bread of life, I believe. Luke 4, 18 teaches us that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is an admonition from Jesus for us, as it was for Him. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that for this time spent together to worship you, Father. All praise and glory and honor is yours, O King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.